is that darn Cardi Jew? They're making us ravenous look horrible. Shalom, and welcome to another exciting edition of the Torah Watchman Show, LLC. None other than your humble karate servant here, Rev Your Arvin Emmett, where you'll find facts, not fiction, not propaganda, not personal biases, but only the Emmett truth. That is my product guarantee. I hope everyone's been well. In the week of Sukkot, I could not think of a better, spectacular, blockbuster documentary presentation to make other than the extraordinary history of the Ad Rock Citron. I've actually been growing uh, Ad Rock Citron for several years now. Why? Because it's a challenge. It's a very fragile, very difficult plant to grow, especially in the colder climates of Maryland, United States, even though it gets pretty hot here. It gets up to 30 degrees or more Celsius in some of our summers here, if you're curious. Of course, that is cooler in most places in Rusalayim during, during the summer months, right? Anyway, let's get started. As always, I want to point back to the Torah as our initial baseline of truth before we jump into other historical, scholarly uh, findings and opinions and, and discoveries. So let me get started. My sources are Primarily, the Torah, Jerusalem Post has some scholarly articles. I vetted them before I even chose to do this video. I don't like Jerusalem Post a little bit because they're, they're pretty much left of center and uh, uh, very against uh, uh, Zionism. They're against Benjamin Netanyahu. They're against a lot of Orthodox rabbis as far as religious right of center as far as Judaism is concerned. But regardless, occasionally... They, they're not afraid to post what Robinus would call scandalous articles. Hindsight is 2020. It's very easy to judge a matter when you have the benefit of looking back across time. 2,000 years ago, I would say 2,000, maybe uh, th uh, 300, 400, 500 years ago. When you look back at that, you see what I call in the IT industry pattern intelligence. And that's where I'm at. Now, I already did a previous um, Torah Watchman show on Sukkot, and you can check it out on, on YouTube under slash word and board. I just look up Rev Yar Ben Hammond when you go to Google, and you'll see my videos and my podcast. I hope you're, you're welcome to join them because they're completely free. Some, some rabbis, some others uh, charge a subscription fee. I don't because I love to teach, and I love to bring smiles to pe people's face. And I love to have an epiphany and, and a reckoning and see people, hey, I did not hear this before. This is fascinating. And that encourages them to study independently, okay? So in Varakra, chapter 23, we have, <clears throat> we have a, a, an introduction, several verses there, about the 15th of the seventh month, okay? Not other than the 15th day of Tesserae. Um, in which we have Sukkot. The, it begins the Hag, it begins the, the day of hard, hard, uh, hard stop from any kind of work at all. And then you have a seven day march to, uh, to a parashah, which is like the Shabbat, and followed by uh, um, uh, Simchat Torah. Yeah, the giving of the Torah. So in Vayakra, uh, you can turn to me about the section, the key section here, it talks about the the beginning of Sukkot, the proper beginning of Sukkot. One footnote here, in the diaspora, the rabbinates have mandated two days of hog instead of Israel, which is one day of hog. When I said hog, I said the, the head day, the highest ascension religious day. There's only one day mentioned for the hog in the Torah. But the rabbinists like to add a little bit of flavors, a little bit more icing to the cake, add a secret ingredient to that cake. It may taste much different than the cake you ate uh, when, when you sat down at a merit supper at Mount Sinai. I don't know, all kidding aside. I just want to read for you uh, this brief section here. 
The seventh day period uh, of Sukkot is also known as the festival of huts or booths. It literally is. Sukkot, at the least common denominator, if you want to just break it down, you are to build a hut or booth made out of pretty much um, some building materials, um, the leafy plants, the four species uh, as detailed in this section here. And this is namely um, the hot archery, and I'll get more details about that soon. Uh, the myrtle, um, we have the lulav, um, we have other uh, uh, swampy plants along with that too. You can find these actually in many places in the United States, essentially are plants that grow um, uh, very close to a brook or a water waterway or a swampy place like that, um, uh, like a willow, that kind of thing. Th these kind of very thick leafy trees were used as building materials in that you would use them to cover the sides of the sukkah, to show that its vegetation is agrarian and that you are living literally off the land as opposed to a lot of what rabbinists do. They use steel poles, use plastic and things like that on the wall. My sukkah, my sukkah at home is actually none other than my wooden gazebo. It's all organic and has a, a kosher bamboo mat on top. And I have <clears throat> other uh, decorations and things of that nature. Um, but I like to stay, stay organic. And a lot of rabbis, a lot of sedum brothers of mine, I heard uh, from my uh, cousin up in New York, in Brooklyn, uh, she said that she saw a lot of Hasidim there getting lumber, and they want to get lumber and use lumber for, for their sukkah, okay? Um, so we have here that this is a, a ritual, a ceremony, um, a festival, a celebration that we'll never ever forget that we were brought out of Egypt in a great and wonderful, miraculous way, that it was only Elohim that took care of us in the wilderness and no one else. He delivered us. He sheltered us with the, with the clouds of glory, literally. You know, the, the, uh, the Gentiles, the, the secular nations of the planet, they put their faith in concrete and mortar and rebar and other things like this. And they see a very strong foundation above the head that feel protected. We feel protected when we can see through our bamboo roof and see the stars and know above there is Shamaim. So that's a difference there. I just want to point that out briefly. So we're talking again about date, uh, date palm fawns. Fawns is, is like a finger, it's like it fans out to the actual leaves of the palm. Um, a branch of a braided tree, willows uh, by the brook, it tells you where to find these. Uh, these are not difficult plants to find, but they're impossible to find in the time of Moshe and the wandering in the wilderness of Sinai, you know, the, the uh, wilderness literally the wilderness of sin, as it's called, you know, the Jews wandered for 40 years in that desert, desolation area. Um, and a lot of people thought, think that uh, Sukkot was actually a holiday that was celebrated in, in the time of Moshe. No, Moshe never celebrated Sukkot, ever, ever, okay? It wasn't until he commissioned his servant, Joshua, to, when he crossed the uh, River Jordan into the land of Canaan, when they settled and took over some of the Canaanite cities and started um, the tribal uh, occupation of some of the lands and, to, and took ownership of some of the cities there. Then they started celebrating that holiday for the first time. Uh, it's a pilgrimage, <coughs> excuse me, it's a pilgrimage holiday. You know, Pesach, you know, you, ha you have uh, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur uh, in that area, and then you have, you have Sukkot. These are the holidays, I mean, pilgrimage, I mean, you're on a rich religious uh, travel. You think about Muslims going to Mecca, it's the same kind of thing there. So we're constructing booths, and uh, verse, verse 41, let's see, verse 40, verse 41, verse 42, uh, every resident is to do this, uh, including the sojourner that resides with the Jewish people, the uh, pr proselyte, the convert. They're welcome to, believe it or not. Um, this is a, a, a eternal celebration that we'll always uh, remember. Um, these are considered um, a high holiday. Um, but the facts and origins of the history of Ebrach Citron deserve 
some very close scrutiny. Um, I also want to throw in Nehemiah 8, chapter 8. There's a very interesting section. Yes, I'm holding my notes. I want to stay on script. Uh, so to assure you, I'm not speaking my opinion here. Very important. This is Don't shoot the messenger, you know, a news break. So the, the Talmudic story of the Adrock Citron is a story in itself. Okay, it has changed several times. It has changed since uh, before uh, Shukan Arak was actually codified between the late 1700 and early 1800. That is Halakha as we know it today, the new version of Halakha. The holiday of Sukkot approaches, and you know, everyone likes to order these things in advance. Uh, you can order them on Amazon, even eBay, but most people order them through rabbi approval. They determine kosher root on these items. And they take a little money off the side there, of course. You go to your synagogue, you order weeks and weeks, maybe a month in advance to get them. What's especially expensive is the Citron. Those very small ones, if you get a price break between $15 and $25, but you could spend easily $100, $300, $500. And I even heard of some larger, very gorgeous uh, Etrog Citron that run up to $1,000. I, I, I'm not kidding you. Okay? So, in. Um, and uh, the quote here is Leviticus chapter 23, 40, when he talks the fruit of a beautiful tree. This is none other of the Hadad tree, okay? Now, through extra extrapolation, interpretation, and debates, various debates over a period of time, uh, through uh, the Babylonian Talmud, Jerusalem Talmud, a.k.a. Palestinian Talmud, they have reached conclusion, as if they, the rabbinists primarily, have reached a conclusion that the Hadar was none other was a citrus fruit tree, uh, and of course it was Etrog Citron. Um, uh, for thousands of years, uh, this uh, at least two thousand years, this was the the traditional belief. Okay. It also had many medicinal uses as well. Um, according to Halakha, or actually according to uh, a Tomal tractate known literally as a cult, and other tractates, and even the Zohar, the Kabbalah, they said that uh, the story or the tradition of the Adrog Citron was handed down from father and son all the way back to Mount Sinai. I even read one story, a fanciful story, that Moshe was taken away on a cloud to the, the place of an Adrog Citron so we could bring back some of the fruit and some of the evidence back to the Jewish people and show them and talk about it uh, as part of oral tradition. Of course, this is not found in the Torah. This is a belief. It's a legend. It's a story. And every culture and every religion and every society norm has these stories. Okay? They do. But it's not a halakha. It's not in the Torah. Therefore, it's not truthful. I'm sorry. Okay? So if it's not in the good book, uh, you know, it's not from God's divine mouth. So if it's extrapolated and interpreted, debated, opinionated by a human being, it, it is flawed. It's just like whispering and in, in a Dixie cup tied to a string. You played this game as a child. You have 20 people in a line. What you whisper in that cup or what you whisper in each other's ear. By the time it gets to the last kid, and line there is completely different. And that's what we're talking about at Rock Citron. But if you read Chabad, especially Chabadniks have, a, have the most standardized view of the Rock Citron as a fourth species. Uh, again, they say that it's a fruit of the Hadar tree. And the Hadar tree, of course, smells of leaves, the fragrance, everything smells like it's fruit. And um, most of the time that is true. Even though in the past there was actually debate among rabbis whether or not to use an etrog, a lemon, or some other citrus fruit. Okay? Oranges, for instance, are citrus fruit. So they concluded the Hadar tree was a citrus fruit bearing tree. Okay? From these passages. It does not say etrog citron anywhere in the Torah. It does not say etrog citron anywhere in the Tanakh of the sacred writing. In fact, Nehemiah chapter 8, uh, when he took over Judea and cleansed the temple, rebuilt. Uh, Jerusalem's way, uh, walls and gates, it's dispatched his men, his minion, to the hills and mountains to bring back what? Branches of olive, olive trees, yes, to build the sukkah. 
So that was a fruit bearing tree uh, at his time that he read in the Torah, he made a conclusion because during the time of Nehemiah, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail with this, it was total, total desolation. Total, wild animals running everywhere, um, all kinds of uh, different races of people, uh, occupiers, you hear about the Samaritans and everything else. <clears throat> it, it was uh, untilled fields, uh, there was not much. But occasionally you saw uh, an olive tree or something like that. An olive is a fruit, believe it or not, like a banana or an orange, okay? But it's not a citrus tree. <laughs> but interesting, Nehemiah, that's what he used for his soka. And he is trained and instructed the people and their tradition to use olive branches with the olive fruit there, okay? I'll get more to the Hadar tree later, I promise. Now, <clears throat> where did uh, the Atra Citron originate? Well, I was surprised to find this out too. I always believed the Atra Citron grew natively in Eretz Israel, but this is not true, okay? When Yahshua came in the land of Canaan, conquered um, Jericho and conquered several other Canaanite cities and started the tradition of Sukkot as mandated by Moshe, when your land of Israel make a pilgrimage, you know, just go and travel and find these building materials, the four species, you know, the four species at a Hadar tree is little, it's problematic and debatable today. I'll get to that. But you know, there's no, there's nothing at all mentioned about a citrus, a lemon tree, orange tree, or anything like that, lime tree, whatever. It was not mentioned at all in those, in those historical accounts. Not, not in the, uh, the book of, of Joshua, not in um, the books of the first and second kings, the judges, nothing is there. Even King, uh, King David did not say anything about um, the Adrock Citron or a citrus plant or anything in Hebrew that you could possibly transliterate to something that's meaningful in English or any other language you may speak. But again, the Atrox Citron was known for its medicinal purposes. In fact, some Jews actually like to slice it up and believe it or not, put it in a washing machine as a nice scent. Your clothes, okay, nothing wrong with that. And actually, it's considered as an extract. It's expensive. You can put it in, um, in a, um, like a vaporizer or uh, something, like a, um, something like a device that would be able to evaporate uh, the water and the extract, it smells really good, okay? It may be antiviral, I don't know. But that's how it's used. Anyway, <clears throat> 2,300 years ago, roughly, the time of Alexander the Great, right before the Roman Empire came and invaded Judea, um, it was actually in that documentation there that existed the Ed Rock Citron was known in the West, and when I say West, along the Mediterranean coast. However, recently scientists have, have tracked down fossil seeds and things of this nature, did genetic testing of the Edrock Citron of the day, compared it to fossil seeds um, that, that can be actually dated, believe it or not, uh, going back thousands of years, and they've tracked down the original Edrock Citron where it was native, it was not in Eretz Israel, it was not in Italy, it was not in Greece, it was not in the Iberian Peninsula, it was not in Morocco. It was in China. Actually, it was along the Chinese border with India, it, when, within the Himalayan mountain range. That's what I found out. Of course, in China, they're very superstitious, during, especially during that time, and they still are today in some, some uh, provinces there, like Wuhan. Um, they, you know, Citron has lots of seeds there. And when you see a fruit with lots of seeds, you think of fertility, right? Well, they, they literally, it, uh, the Chinese believe this. They're pagans. You know, they believe this that if you have the Atrox Citron in your home, then you're guaranteed to have a lot of children, your wife would be fertile, you'll be fertile, and you have a big family. Well, that tradition passed on to rabbinates, and they passed that on in Ashkenazim and Sephardim, that if you have a large, healthy, uh, just voluptuous uh, Atrox in your, uh, Citron in your home, then that's, that, that's for good health and uh, having children and, and et cetera, et cetera. That is the belief. It was known as a superfood, and it spread throughout the Persian Empire. That's where Alexander the Great picked up on it. Okay, so it was native, native, and uh, between in the mountains of, of India, it was native, native uh, in those areas there. Um, 
along, uh, along waterways and creeks and brooks and things of that nature, uh, 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 well springs and things of that nature, so it grew in a more moderate climate, not too cold and not too hot, okay? Uh, the adverse citron, incidentally, believe me, from my experience, are trying to grow them by seed and grow them not by grafting, but ordering from nurseries, and you can order them. Um, uh, it's a very delicate and very fragile plant, okay? It's subject to disease. It's subject to parasitic mites. Uh, it's subject to dropping its leaves suddenly. If you overwater it or underwater it, it's very susceptible to, to, to lack of lime and pH in the soil, etc., etc. It's a very difficult plant to grow, and believe it or not, <clears throat> it only lives from 10 to 15 years, and it takes five to seven years before it blooms and creates any fruit. Think about that, okay? So, the most commonly known at Rog comes from Calab Calabria, Calabria, Italy, which is an island just off, uh, let's see, if, uh, think of that, yeah, it, it's, it's an island off of Italy along the coastal area there, okay? There's other, there's another island off of Greece, uh, similar name, I'm getting these confused at the time, I apologize, I'll tell you about that in a moment. And so, it was uh, it transplanted, it was brought by, you hear about the Indian spice trade, you know, Christopher Columbus sailed across the world thinking he, the world was much smaller, he would go and find an easy path going to India for, for all the spices and everything. Well, the same thing was there. The, trade, the uh, Indian trade was very important to, um, to places in Europe and places along the Mediterranean coast. The West, as we knew it back then, when I say West, I'm talking about North America. Okay, So they brought all kinds of things uh, from the Orient, they brought it down to Eretz Israel eventually. Of course, uh, Alexander the Great picked, up, picked off where, where the Persians uh, started initially because they occupied a lot of these areas. Um, and the Adirondack Citron was known. And they actually thought that it was good for your health. Okay, They actually believed that. So they had their own superstition around the Adirondack at that time. The bottom line is the Adirondack Citron was never native at any time in the land of Canaan, Mount Sinai, uh, Median, in those areas where the Jewish people wandered for 40 years, never in Eretz Israel, never. It was transplanted and brought into these areas over a period of, of 2,000 years, literally. And actually the fruit itself was brought, not the plant, not the seeds, because they didn't know how to plant the thing. And it was very difficult to grow unless you had uh, adequate water and a proper moderate temperature and things like that. In some areas, and and, and Israel, it's just too hot to grow. It, it is. It is. So you have to have really watch it and really babysit it and, and nurse made it. You really do. It, it's not like growing a, a fig tree or, or even olives or even grapes or dates or pomegranates or any of those wonderful fruit you find in Israel today in farmer's market. Um, what's interesting, they discovered because they could only bring the fruit, and of course, as you travel back in that time, you didn't have refrigeration, right? My wife asked this question. They brought it in green, you know, and so it would gradually ripen, and hopefully during the shipping process, it would not rot, and sometimes it did. So this became a, a problem as um, rabbinets, uh, originally Ashkenazi Jews, and Spain, in that area, uh, when the rabbinates took hold of Judaism, uh, in their competition with Cardi Jews uh, from the 9th century on, 19th, 13th century, 13th, 15th century, the, it became a very lucrative market to trade in at rocks. It really was. Like I said, um, um, it cost a lot of money because it was rare, relatively rare, and it took a long time to distribute uh, in the trade between the Orient and Israel and other parts of the Mediterranean. And eventually, when the Jews were exiled in 135 CE from Judea, you know, you hear about uh, um, Hadrian's curse and all of this, and Jews were everywhere ac across Europe and, and Morocco and uh, Iberian Peninsula, and Poland, all these areas, Lithuania. Uh, when they were spread there, of course, the Atrog would not grow in these uh, northern climates, so they ha were highly dependent on the fruit. Now, the solution by some rabbis. And actually, uh, the process and methodology existed before Talmudic times, believe it or not, is grafting. 
And today in aquaculture, we do a lot of grafting. Of course, this is forbidden in the Torah. Any kind of hybridization or acting as God and creating your own chimera uh, plant, that kind of thing, is forbidden. But Rabbi took it upon himself to do this. Because in their minds, it had our tree, again, was a citrus bearing fruit tree. And they said it could be a lemon, could be, could be in that rock. And of course, they are very close to same. And I'll, and I'll get more detail later. Genetic analysis says the lemon and the etrog are almost genetically the same. In fact, when you graft them, they are the same. They are identical. And when you get in etrog citron, it's just in a box, bo a whole box full of the, the etrog citron there, you don't know if it came from a grafted uh, uh, nursery or farm or one that grew naturally from seed that was not grafted. Again, the ones that were not grafted, that grew naturally, many of them died, and it was very difficult to keep them going ongoing. Now, you can think about down during the time of, of Joshua and Moshe's mandate about all these festivals. The Festival of Hut was about primarily, and I told someone today on Facebook, least common denominator, you build a hut and a booth out, out of natural things around, around your environment. You know? You build, and it's temporary. You can see holes in, in the roof, and it rained. You probably get rained on, but it's temporary hut and booth. It's built among uh, the four species, which are a lot of green, uh, green leafy plants. Of course, when you go and cut down, uh, when you take branches from something, like a palm tree or, 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 or any kind of fruit-bearing tree, olive tree, in that process, you probably will kill the tree, and so they, they scan it, and they take the, the whole stem, the trunk of the tree, and they use this for poles. Now, I'm guessing this is what uh, Nehemiah was, uh, was, um, was thinking at that time. I don't have proof of this. But more than that, you cannot stand up a hut uh, for your family made out of palm, palm leaves. He just came. So what they probably did, they took the, uh, the wood, it was all wood, and they took the... Uh, uh, the stems of the plants they cut, extracted all these four species from, and used them for the four corners of the booth, the hut. Logically, that's what happened. But again, this is just my uh, educated opinion. You can have your own opinion if you want to. Rabbis today, you have no problem using steel poles and plastic for their walls. I use wood. Okay. I'm old school. Okay. So, uh, moving forward here, hybridization grafting because what the solution is to a very fragile a very hard to grow uh, in a very specific environment very sensitive plant to grow <clears throat> and extend its life and extend its crop is to graft it with a lemon tree that was more resilient better genetics i guess so when you graft the ad rock citron to the tr to the trunk the trunk part of a lemon tree you end up with a more beautiful uh, at Rog, and a more wondrous fruit, as, as rabbis interpreted what the Adar tree was. So many rabbis cheated the system because they, they controlled information at the time. Many people did not know how to read, even in the Middle Ages. They didn't, especially 2,000 years ago. Most of the world was illiterate, unless you were scholars and rabbis uh, in the Sanhedrin and, and reading uh, Torah scrolls or teaching Torah and things of that nature. You did not know how to read. So ignorance is bliss when you're making a good profit on that rock citron, okay? You see where this is going, okay? Uh, you think about the, the million dollar um, industry of the Ed Rock today, uh, it is incredible. Uh, I mean, it keep, uh, you know, fortunately it keeps a lot of people working this time of year, but a lot of people make a lot of money off of perfect Ed Rock citron. And, it's for, and they have very very precise, very meticulous details of the characteristic Adrox Citron determine whether or not it is kosher. Like, like the small little bump on one end, the small little stem, you're supposed to invert it back and forth when you say the broca, and you're supposed to hold it in your right hand, or if you're left hand, you hold the lulav and uh, the, the willow and the myrtle and other things like that, you hold it there and you wave it back and forth. I already told you about it, you can check how about it tells you how to do this, you want to do that. Um, so it costs a lot of money. The citron is the focal point there for all the four species. In fact, many rabbis and many Orthodox-minded Jews, they don't even think about, about any of the other species primarily 
Um, those are easy to find. They're relatively inexpensive. What's hard to find is the perfect large um, Edrock Citron without any blemishes or anything else. Okay, why does it have to be perfect as far as no blemishes to be kosher root? It goes back to the Torah as far as first fruits, um, having a first of your, of your cattle and sheep and, and goats and things of that nature, the very best very best of anything, grain offering, meal offering, it had to be very best. But um, a small little footnote here, the Adra Sitron never was native in Israel at any time during the, during the, during the uh, kingdom of King Solomon, for instance, or Hezekiah. They was never grown in there. If it was not in Israel, it was surely not brought as a first fruit to the temple. Just consider that, okay? And how would you take a delicate plant there's almost half a life, very delicate, very sensitive, leaves falling off, and only grew its fruit uh, during, during late summer, you know, in the early fall. That's when you harvest. How can you justify having something that's totally inedible? It's the most bitter, highest pH factor fruit that's out there. It's so bitter that it would, it would draw up your face more than a persimmon. It really would, all kidding aside. You cannot eat it. It's inedible, okay? Like I said, it's used for clothes fragrances, uh, extracts for, for fragrances and things of that nature. Uh, it's inedible. It really is. I mean, I, you can eat a lemon maybe a little bit. My daughter likes that, but you can't even t tolerate an Adderall Citron. Plus, its thorns are viciously evil and that I've been stuck many times like a hypodermic needle. It is a very difficult plant. It has bigger, bigger needles on it and thorns than a rose. <laughs> so you think about harvesting these things, much as telling your son to go out, daughter go out there and harvest the uh, Etra Citron, you'll be cut up, you have to wear gloves and, and, and cough all over your arm to be able to even harvest it. That's how difficult it is if you can keep it alive, okay? Now, uh, rabbinates in the Talmud is very interesting. I'll try to skip through this. It's very, a lot of information. It's known as Adam's apple. Adam's apple, you know, go back to Adam, you go back to Havilah, the Garden of Eden, you know, remember in Bereshit, in the very beginning, after Adam and Havilah were created for each other, uh, God placed uh, the tree of knowledge and good and evil there, you remember the story of the serpent, of the, uh, the mystical, uh, beautiful fruit on that tree, it was not an apple, we don't know what kind of fruit it was, but what Robinus claimed, it was at Ross Citron, so first of all, you picture, Havala, taking off an Etra Citron from that tree and eating it, and it's totally repulsive, and offering it to Adam for the fall of mankind. That's what they're telling you. Again, Robinus teach that it's handed down through oral tradition from Mount Sinai between father and son, because Moshe was taken away on a cloud to find an Etra Citron outside of that desert area, where? Canaan, uh, Canaan, I believe, and, and bring it back and show the people and, and, and go forth with the opinionated part of Viacra, okay? As, as finding what the Hadar tree was, okay? I'm trying to move through fast, okay? So, um, this tree of knowledge concept just made it more significant, made it more mystical, uh, made it a legend, a myth, and it's something that you can't quantify, you make it supernal, equal, to what God, <clears throat> God produces. Because if the Adam's apple, Adam's apple, was indeed the Adra Citron, this is something that deliberately and premeditatively Elohim created in the Garden of Eden with perfection. Okay? Uh, just think about that. <clears throat> so Jews living in the Holy Land and in Persia had direct access to the Adrog uh, because the they were closer to the data source. They were close to where, where the ships uh, had embarked to the coast from the long journey to India, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they could benefit from that. Um, in fact, a professor of the Balkani Institute of Agricultural Research and Beth Dagan cites Maimonides' thesis presented as a guide uh, for the perplexed that were towards mandate of these particular four species. Again, it was in debate many, many uh, hundreds of years ago uh, at that time. Was it, was, it, was it a citron? Was it a lemon? Was it an orange? Can we use a lemon in place of the atrog? Can we use a grafted uh, 
uh, Edrock Citron versus a natural grown by seed, unmolested uh, Edrock Citron. A lot of these debates were going on near that time before Shukana Rock was codified between the uh, 17th century and 18th century. So uh, I've described to you briefly this ritual. Um, the, rit uh, the botanical historians follow the Ad Rock from its origins from far east westward. Again, the rabbis who controlled the narrative during that time, to say 2,000 years ago, they had in their hands this, this very beautiful, it is beautiful, Ad Rock Citron, big yellow fruit. They got it from, the, uh, from a trader that came there. They bought it off. They really loved it, and then they told other rabbis about it, and then they, they had a minion, they had a decision about that in their synagogue, per se, or the Sanhedrin. I don't remember the Sanhedrin even talking about Edrock Cetron. I, I really don't. But the story goes that it was traded ultimately into Eretz Israel, especially Judea, say 2,000 years ago, right before uh, the ending of the Maccabees, um, in the ending of, of uh, Alexander the Great. So they were trading it back and forth, and they were actually using it in their various occult pilgrimage uh, rituals, okay, actively. So they also said in the Talmud, hydro uh, is a word derivative from, from Hadar tree, which means it must grow along the water. I want to point out something I just realized today for the first time, okay? Okay, myrtle trees, willow trees, palm trees. They all grow fairly near water sources. Why would these species import it for the people of Israel to celebrate Sukkot as building materials, okay? Why? Well, think about where Israel, where the Jewish Hebrews lived in Goshen, Egypt. And think about they lived along um, the, the uh, Sea of Reeds, you know? They lived along that waterway. Well, where in, where, what kind of plants do you think grew along there? These are things to call zakar, you to remember the life you left, what type of plant life was there, because they knew what these plants were. When you have memory, it's more important if you could smell something and actively touch something in your past, you would you'd be more easier not to forget that, okay? That's the point I'm trying to make. Why, why have four species out of these uh, leafy, leafy plants that are hydro, that grow along the water, uh, they need plentiful water source to grow a, a big, thick, leafy, uh, uh, leafy plant system, um, and dates and things like that. You, you know how big a palm tree can be, and the, and the date tree and all of this. Um, so is those, these trees were, were indicative in the, in the land of Egypt along the Sea of Reeds and Goshen, okay? So the Jewish people were, were we're uh, familiar with these things, okay? I already told you about Alexander the Great. This is uh, three, 382 uh, BCE, as before Common Era, if you want to date this again. Um, there is a tractate called Sukkah, and you can look that up if you have that tractate. I have that, chapter 4, verse 9, and it has a lot of information here about a story of the Sadducees um, getting in an argument with a, with a Hellenist Jew over doing liberation, uh, liberation, that means don't use wine, but use water, because we uh, actually the first day of Sukkot, by tradition, is the first day of what we expect when we start praying for rain and winds that bring storms that bring rain and things of that nature. So tonight I'm going to have uh, a boss full of fresh filtered water there uh, and just pour it over my hands. We do this anyway with a cleansing sermon. I was just, I'm going to talk about this tonight because I've got coming about how important it is to have that water there on the table as an object lesson, okay? And I'm teaching this to my daughter, too. So, moving forward here, again, the gradual dispersion of Jews all over the four corners of the earth, and that's why we wave the lulav in four corners, you know, north, south, east, west. We do this several times. That's why we do it by tradition. We actually use, rabbinists have taught us, use building materials for worshiping devices. And the focal point is at Ross Citron. We're focusing more on that Citron, I promise you, than building a wonderful sukkah or inviting someone that's that, uh, like a no hide to your sukkah dinner or kiddush. We're focusing more on that Citron, especially men. There's eagle there. 
I have the best Citron than anyone else. It's bigger, it's better, it's larger. It's big as your ego, right? And it's the ego of the rabbinates. You know, they made lots of money, lots of pesos, lots of marks, lots of shekels, uh, lots of shillings, whatever the currency system was during that time. They made a lot of money off the Ed Ross Citron trading business. In fact, it caused fruit feuding wars, really, Ed Ross Citron wars. You can look that up too. And where they got in trouble with farmers who were unclean Gentiles uh, in Greece, they were doing their best to supply Adderall Citron, but then they found out why they were so beautiful and so perfect because they were grafted with lemon tree. And then, although Rabbi said it was kosher, and then later on, by the time of Shukan Alrock, by the 18th century, they said it was not kosher. Of course, they're not kosher. The Torah said no hybridization, okay? Even though you can grow an easier plant, it's more tolerant weather. The, the thing is, why we don't do hybrid, or, why we don't allow hybridization, because God wants things to be difficult, to be a challenge, so we can pray for the outcome, right? At least that's my opinion. Okay. Um, they are uh, Greek uh, uh, scholars and other people that actually talk about this. I'm going to show you some pictures here of some Jewish coinage that actually has pictures of that Rotitron. So it was all in the coinage, even the time of the fake Messiah, um, the, uh, um, the, during the uh, Kokba Rebellion, and that was around 132-135 CE, that led to the destruction of what was left for Jerusalem. You know, it was raised to the ground. And actually, Rabbi Akiva helped that rebellion, and he lost his life doing that. He fought for a fake rabbi. To, uh, for insurrection and got thousand, tens of thousands of Jews murdered and killed in a useless war. Uh, that's all I'm going to say about that. Okay? So, <clears throat> even Hasidim in their garter, some of the garters they have around their waist that separate the uh, supernal from the carnal part of your soul and of this. I have one of these two. No problem with that at all. In fact, uh, that's why you have uh, images of, of, of Etrogs, you know, and printed on some of these things, really. I, I'm not kidding. But it was in our coinage, and I'll, uh, I'll show you these pictures here. Just look behind me here, and I'll show you. Um, all of this was based on a lot of opinions of Rabbi Akiva. He was a big supporter of the, of the fake Messiah. Uh, he was talking about how to implement the four species, and of course, it was at Ra Citron, it was the four species. So since it was a focal point, almost to the point, I would dare say, idolatry, in other words, you're thinking more about, about how you're going to sell your last piece of property or work three jobs just to, to afford a large, beautiful Ed Rock Citron to have for your family so you can have good luck, fertility. You just think about the hubris and all of these things created by Robinette to make a lot of money uh, and to lord over people as overlords. Uh, you know, um, it, it's throughout our part of history, all these stories that took... Too lengthy to get into this video, okay? Um, again, uh, there's a story in 1329, Victoria's Golov Florence prohibited the Republic of Tessa from engaging in Etrog trade. So when the Jewish people in the diaspora were subject to like Russian Empire pogroms or uh, anti-Semitism, the various caliphates, um, they saw this, they knew the Adra Citron was a religious Jewish symbol, so they halted these trade. And that created a lot of conflict. So what would happen if you didn't have Ad Ad Citron? Would you substitute to a lemon? No. Well, you use what you can find, right? Right? Uh, my wife's grandfather did not have um, um, Hanukkah candles and things of this nature. Some people use potatoes and you put a candle in it. Uh, that's what you do when you're dirt poor and you don't have supplies. Uh, um, very humble and very sweet, and believe it or not, Elohim likes that better than something fancy. It really does. Uh, so these rabbinates were a lot of fancy pants, and they really got in trouble in these trades because they're so dependent on Ad Rock Citron. In other words, the Sukkot holiday was not even meaningful unless you have an Ad Rock Citron there, at least if you're a man. Because uh, in Orthodoxy, you know, if you're a woman, Orthodox or not, you're not allowed to hold the Lulav or the Citron at all. It's a man's game, not a woman's game. The women watch and listen to the brokers and prayers. That's how it is in orthodoxy. Okay? Welcome to orthodoxy and welcome to rabbinical Judaism. That's all I got to say. I'm from that, and so I speak from experience. This is not just my opinion, okay? Um, many stories uh, claim that when uh, 
when an uh, individual came to the Holy City, they visited the stores of Maimonides, he saw cases of Evra citrons that was arriving uh, uh, on, uh, to the coast, uh, maybe Haifa, or wherever, you know, um, from other areas, the Red Sea, uh, coming from India, uh, was talking about this, okay? Uh, and they were actually growing. I, I want to be fair, 2,000 years ago, they actually attempted trying to grow at Rosetron in Judea, at least, and maybe in certain parts of Samaria, too. But its origin was China and uh, India in, in that area, in the Far East. It was a, it was a Far Eastern Orient, Orient native plant there that was uh, traded and brought to Israel to be planted eventually and throughout the Mediterranean coast. That's why we have... Um, uh, farms, uh, fields, a galore of Evrog citrons that are grown in California and other areas like in the United States, a warmer climate, and it's a huge trade and a huge market for that this time of year. Okay? The, gra the hideous grafted atro atrogeme, I mean, atrogeme is plural for Evrog. I love these words. Um, again, I already told you, I'm not going to get into it again in a different section here. But the short story, the grafted at Rav Citron, no longer, since Shukan al Rock was codified, no longer considered kosher. It is. It is. It is it. In fact, a rabbi literally has to monitor the entire life cycle of the Azar Citron plant from beginning to end to make sure it's kosher. That's what it is. And that raises the price. You see where I'm going. If it's grafted, it could be mass produced, which breaks the, hybrid, the hybridization rule in the Torah. <laughs> But, you know, what it is now, we're stuck with our tradition and we're stuck with what we have from the rabbinate. Um, Karites, uh, I said this before, they don't focus on Adral Citron, they focus on the Torah, they focus on Nehemiah, a great, wonderful scribe, a righteous mensch, a Sadiq of his time. He did so many wonderful things to save Judaism, save the, temp, the holy, all of this. And he used olive branches and probably olive tree uh, stems and trunks for the construction of their, their sukkah, okay? Uh, let's see, skipping here, uh, Rabbi Meir, um, and I can't pronounce his name, is uh, Katzin Leo Bolgan, I believe, uh, known as a, the Maharam. Uh, this is 1482, 1565. He is in Padua, Italy. That was a huge at Raw Citron production site, okay? Um, they were different students. They studied this and, sh and they had, they were contributors to the Shukon al Rock about the at Raw Citron and its history. At least the history that Robinette say, and you will never hear in any Orthodox shul in the time of Sukkot, and we read a lot of Torah, a lot of Matsars, a lot of Sidros and things of this nature, you will never read chapter 8 of Nehemiah because it goes against the grain of thought, the rabbinates, about the Adrog Citron being codified as a Hadar tree, the wondrous uh, uh, tree of fruit, which is none other than Adrog Citron. Okay? So there's other, I'm going to list four things here quickly. Um, some of the reasons why the Merkov, that's, that's, a, that's a designator name for uh, all things grafted as far as Adrog Citron is concerned, the fruit must be whole and not missing a piece or, or hazard, okay? The grafted at raw considered as being partially from each fruit and therefore not complete, okay? Um, and they claim that the, the tree that grows, the grafted tree that grows at rock smells more like a lemon than an at rock, okay? Um, and probably doesn't have many thorns either. That's easy, right? Uh, possibly identify the fruit is determined from the trunk of the tree again. You can tell if it's grafted or not very easily. Uh, because uh, the fruit consists of partially of a lemon, using it uh, for the mitzvah entails adding additional species, which violates the provision of the Baal Tosiv, which is adding unto a mitzvah. So get this, using a grafted uh, citron, Edward citron, known, as, uh, um, known in that time as not kosher, it said it violate the 613 mitzvah, our Jewish law, but they have no problem adding or subtracting from the Torah and what I've just given you so far, which is an abomination and a curse before God to do that. Go figure. So it is a curse and a prohibition 
uh, Lashana Ra, Rav, whatever, something, something evil, you know, to be able to, to do that. Okay, to take, you would have to take uh, the leaves and things from that lemon hybrid Etar Citron uh, and add it to the four species, and that would make it not kosher. Of course, it would not make it kosher. Okay? Uh, number four, interspecies grafting of the kind is a biblical prohibition. It is repugnant to God. So they admit that. So they follow that commandment, which I agree with. You can't even have an ox and donkey simultaneously plow in the same field. You cannot intentionally plant different species of plant in one row where they could possibly cross pollinate. If it happens naturally, it's not on you. But if, if you're intentionally trying to grow a better plant, and farmers do this all the time to make extra crop and extra money. And they have to survive and feed starving masses, right? You can't do that if you're an Orthodox Jew. Okay, you see the inconsistencies, not hypocrisies here. Okay? So, most authorities are willing to apply the rationale even if grafting was done by non-Jews. And there's problems with that in Israel and in, in factories and uh, manufacturing like uh, matzah and things like that. All these Jews have to be kosher. All the Jews cannot be unclean Gentile. Thank God for them being a Gentile. Uh, for that production process, the life cycle, beginning to end, um, that's it, to be co considered kosher. And to have a nice little U there, the circle there, right? Um, so that is consideration. Uh, however, uh, it's not clear whether the Abrog and Lemon are in fact considered distinct species according to Halakha. Well, Halakha is 18th century and before, okay? Uh, they even said that Rabbi, Rabbi Akiva worked on the initial halakha, okay? However, today when we have broken apart the human genome, we can take genetic analysis from everything. We can bring cold cases to life and find out who a murderer of some uh, victim 10 years ago with that. It's remarkable. But genetic analysis has proven that there's no genetic, there's no genetic differences at all. They are the identical twins. Same species, same phyla, same genius as a grafted etrog versus a regular etrog that's not been grafted. So and if you say the etrog citron is the fourth species and is the um, Adam's apple, you know, the tree of knowledge and good and evil, so if they're genetically the same, they're identical, so why not use a lemon if you cannot afford a $300, $500, $1,000 etrog citron? Okay, you see where I'm going. Um, trying to wrap this up. <laughs> in uh, 1846, all, all heck broke loose. And, when, and uh, many, many uh, Halakha debates, some won, some were canceled out. Some people were discriminated against in their Halakha belief. Consider many of our sages, the Karate Jews, uh, discriminated against, saying you're not Jewish. Uh, what, uh, you know, uh, keeping only the Torah, not oral tradition. It's an abomination, you're breaking halakha, our halakha, um, and so on and so on. Um, there's, a, there's a place called Corfu, and I mentioned this before. It's just off the coast of Greece. And it's an island, a small little island. I'll show, it's the picture back here, okay, and on the map here. You can see that right there. So uh, they were producing these beautiful, gorgeous, grafted um, uh, erosidron. It actually has pulp. The regular uh, Ezra Citron has very little pulp, so it's not edible, you know, it's full of seeds, essentially, if you can get to it without having um, a dozen hypodermic needles uh, sticking to your skin, you know, you know, really, it really is, okay? So the Kofu fruit issue became a huge rebellion, a huge fight, and these farmers actually dumped thousands of their crop purposely to run up the price of Ezra Citron, because some rabbinates said they were not kosher and they were not going to buy them, not going to use them anymore. So that, you know, the common Jew out there had no problem having that at raw citron, if probably as it was at a cheaper price. The natural at raw citron that had to be monitored and babied and nurtured and coddled and everything else was much more expensive. So that created uh, riots, it created Boston Tea Party moments and that kind of thing. Very interesting, I did not even know about that history, okay? Um, the farmers of Kofu fought back, uh, so did their supporters, and so did the Jews that supported uh, that product distribution, uh, you know, uh, uh, manufacturing process and, and trading process, because they were getting voluptuous amount, just huge amounts of that raw citron without ever running out of supply and everyone could benefit from it, 
And now the rabbin has said, no, uh, we were wrong. Um, you know, it is pro prohibited against the Torah. Okay? The, um, in 1892, described the importers of the Koku Etrogim to the United States as traitors in the blood of Israel. You hear me? Um, not allowed. So in the 18th, early 18th century, these beautiful, gorgeous, hybrid um, Etro Citrons were actually traded in the United States. It's probably San Francisco and other uh, immigration areas, you know, where shipping came from other countries, okay? So there was a lot of blood libels, a lot of pointing fingers, all of this among rabbinates, like-minded rabbinates and everything else. I don't think the Karate's were in the middle of any of this nonsense. This is a rabbinate and problem they invented and the harm and pain was on them and not, not my brothers and sisters among Karate Judaism, okay? Uh, we were involved in this scandalous thing. I'm glad to say that. I wasn't involved because I wasn't in that area of the world. I wasn't on that street. i never been to Kofu before. But it was known as the Kofu Citron, by the way. That's where the name comes from. If you want to find it, you're confused. And a lot of people have questions about what's kosher and what's not kosher for the Edward Citron, even today, because it is confusing. Uh, I'm trying to zip through this here. About uh, defining... What is a kosher Eros Sidron was very difficult. Uh, rabbis had to make a lot of lengthy journeys to check where the plants were grown. Say if Italy was growing a new new farm of Eros Sidron that were not grafted, rabbis had to go there and inspect it before they would uh, tell other synagogues around the world to start ordering and paying for them. Okay? But we didn't make any a lot of friends when the, with those co kofu farmers. Okay? We just did. And this is around 18th, 19th century, they want to look it up. So this is about supply chains and things of this nature. Chabad, Chabad, I already told you this story before. The Almighty God, the Divine Creator, blessed be His name, took Moses on a cloud and flew around the world uh, to find at rock citrons, the right ones, something known as a, a Calab Calabrian at rock uh, game. A lot of words, double speak here. Um, that means true kosher and not grafted. Okay? The modern etrog, um, nothing, of course, would stop the bickering about those etrogs in general and article today in Israel. Several breeds are grown, and some of them are not considered kosher. Okay? Not across every Jewish denomination, per se. Okay? Um, Yemenite etrog is the, oh, is the closest to the original fruit. Genetically speaking, because it was closer to India. And that's where the plant grew natively. Okay? And just think about how to distribute hundreds if not thousands of that rock to that before they brought it. I think a high I think probably half the crop probably fell before it arrived at its destination. You have don't have refrigeration, don't have preserves, that's just the way it is, okay? Ah, in conclusion, okay. Uh, again. Uh, DNA of 12 et etrogeme from a variety of sources found great similarities, different species. In other words, there's something known, you can see it back here, is known as the hand of Buddha. Kid you not. It is an etrog citron, but it has tentacles like a hand. Very strange looking. I've never seen it before, before I researched this topic. You know? You find out all kinds of things when you aren't reading books. It's an amazing concept. Okay? So, but, again, in conclusion, whether it's a grafted at rock from a lemon tree, or not grafted at rock growing naturally by seed, it is genetically identical. In fact, you could literally use a lemon today instead of an at rock citron, buy it on your local kosher market, and be right with the intent of the rabbinates, because many rabbinates in the 13th century thought a lemon and an at rock citron was about the same thing, because lemons were much easier and much cheaper to get, okay? And much easier to grow. So, um, I would like to hear your feedback about this, okay? It's a very interesting story when you go down history and memory lane and start making discoveries and independent research. But you have to learn how to think for yourself. You have to just get out of yeshiva for a while and get out of all the Talmud and everything else and all the 2,000, uh, roughly 2,000, uh, rabbinical and scribe uh, debates and discussions and opinions and all this stuff and just do some independent research 
Know where the root of your religion is. Is it in the Torah or is it in something else that could be pagan? You know, Ebra Sitron natively was grown in a pagan country around China and India where Buddhism and Hinduism was very popular during that time, much older than our religion. Take care. God bless you. God bless you. Good yom talk to you. Reb Yara Ben Emmett signing out here. Remember, from the, the Torah Watchmen show, I speak nothing but the Emmett truth. I shoot from the hill, black and white, the lighthouse on the hill on my head. I show for a blast that's louder than all the rest because I'm a Gulf War veteran. I know how to target your problem statement, everyone's problem statement, help our missiles, and knock it down and bring it down and, and like a broken eggshell and show you if it's a real egg, you know, if it's really an egg of a chicken or an egg of something else. I'm just joking. But anyway, take care of yourself. Please share the wealth of knowledge and love and truth with my video. The other people may have not heard these stories. My wife is surprised what I heard. I actually sent this information to Rabbi. I can't wait to see him and see hear what is her opinion. Yes, he is a rabbinate. You know, even conservative Jews, they are a rabbinate. And they have to hold true with all these myths, legends, and stories. And fairy tales. Take care. God love you. God bless you. Listen, all my love. I dedicate this video to my Cardi brothers and sisters around the world. I love you. And I dedicate this video to my B'nai Noach brothers and sisters around the world too. Take care.